This is the day the Lord has made. Let us what? Rejoice and be glad in it. Isn't that a good verse? You know, one of my grandkids tends to wake up grumpy, you know, and I always want to give him that verse. I don't know why, but he, then he gets sweet after a while, but he starts out grumpy. and just Some people aren't morning people, right? I've always been a morning person, but hopefully we'll all have that joy of this Lord this morning. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just uh, give this service and time to you, Father. We're here dedicated to you. It's not about us. We're not here with selfish motives, Lord. We want to be here with the right attitude, the right mindset, to serve others, to love others, to learn more about you, Jesus. So we give this service to you in Jesus' name. No one sad? Amen. Amen. Here we go, I guess. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, all the future mothers, all the former mothers. I don't know. I'm sure there's one or two in here. But Happy Mother's Day to all of you. Hi. 
Thank you, Jesus. us or forsakes us. Amen. I'm going to worship this next out of his hand. Oh, 
broke into the darkness, created the light. He is the Lord, who is like unto him, never ending in days. He is the Lord, and he comes in power when we call on his name. He is the Lord. Show your power, oh Lord, our God. Show your power, oh Lord, our God, our God. Your God. Is the hope for our nation? You are the Lord. It's the power of God for our salvation. You are the Lord. And we ask not for riches, but look to the cross. You are the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And for our inheritance, give us. Show your power, oh Lord, our God. Show your power, oh Lord, our God. Send your power, oh Lord, our God. Send your power. No. 
we're going to go ahead and take the offering. Hopefully you're ready. <laughs> Thing when I get into it, huh? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Pastor Dave will be next, here next week. Uh, he and his beautiful wife are on a little vacation for celebrating their second wedding anniversary. So, so we you know I know they're having a good time. I've spoke to them, and so that's good. We'll look forward to seeing them next week. Today, though, we have our special treat for Mother's Day. We have our designated hitter is a, a Navy chaplain, uh, Ben Box. We've heard him before, and he's awesome. So. We're excited about that. Ben Box is going to share with us this morning. But we'll have our ushers come forward. We'll get a chance to worship through tithes and offerings. It's a busy week, as always, here at Calvary Chapel of Mesa. We've got Tuesday Bible study, Wednesday Bible study, and this week the women's is at 630. So if you can join for us for any of those, that would be awesome. Don't forget about prayer. And there's a, oh, yeah, and then on the father line, there is a prayer and worship at 630 on Friday. Okay. And there's prayer for an hour Wednesday through Saturday. Okay. Wednesday and Thursday nights always at five. Yeah, all those red prayer seven. went, yeah, they're on there, the, the calendar. And I encourage you to get these out. We'll keep them back here as all those many events. It's almost more than my and little brain to keep track of. you can stop by, you don't have to be there the whole hour. Just stop by, come in, and, you know, even prayer. if you don't like praying out loud, you can just agree in prayer or pray your own. Good. And happy Mother's Day. Uh, happy Mother's Day. I mean, all the ladies look so beautiful. Aren't mothers great? You know, we got my, my wife and I got married when we were very young. I was 21. She was 18. She graduated from high school on Saturday. We got married on Monday. And I, I always look back going, I had no idea what kind of mother she would be. You know, really. I would never. That was the farthest from my mind, really, until about a year or two later. And like, surprise. Well, what an awesome mom she is and was. It was amazing. You know, she'd have she'd lay out these food for our first daughter, like a banana and the apple, and you know, she was eating all this stuff perfect, reading all the mom books and stuff, and and so she was she was awesome. And that's my oldest daughter there that, that she raised, and uh, this one only learned to crawl backwards, okay? And she would back herself, she'd crawl, and then she'd get in the back of a the corner, then she'd cry, and then I have to move her back out, and then she'd crawl backwards in the corner, and she's always kind of done things her way, okay? So anyway. But, but just make sure you say thank you to all the moms out there, bottom of your heart. Jim. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this opportunity that we've got for the poor people that you bless us with the access to worship you in all sorts of ways, Lord, whether it's with our time, with our money, whether it's with our words, whether it's even, Lord God, in our capacity. Just help us to be good stewards, Lord, and worship you in the way that you call us to do. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the mothers and for the fathers. Thank you for the mothers. <laughs> Oh, my soul, worship. 
draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore Amen. Isn't it good to worship the Lord? So good to be here in the house of God with the people of God, praising our great God and Savior. Well, it's a treat to be with you here uh, today. Um, Pastor Dave asked me to fill in, and I'm always honored to do so. I've got another chaplain to cover my little chapel flock on 32nd Street, and a treat to be with you. Uh, last weekend, I was in Washington, D.C. for a graduation, and my wife was there with me, and we were just going to be celebrating and eating at all these different occasions. We were like, we need to do a little exercise. So she signed us up for a run. It was uh, National Women's uh, Half Marathon in 8K. Right there, you the Jefferson Memorial, Lincoln Memorial, Washington Memorial. Beautiful, inspiring place to run. But we just got in the night before. And uh, as we did, um, we had to get up early in the morning to get the race packet and be ready to run. As we start to check in, the only t-shirts they're giving out were women's sizes. And I was like, wait a minute. And then as it gets closer to the starting time, I'm like, I'm surrounded by thousands of women, and there's no other men here. Rochelle, what did you sign me up for? So uh, between that last weekend and then the Mother's Day uh, message this weekend, next weekend I'm going to have to do something really manly. Um, but it's good to be here with you uh, Today, we're going to have a great time in God's Word for Samuel 1 and 2. Let me pray, and we'll begin our time in God's Word together. Gracious God, we thank you so much for your mercy and for your love. We give you this time. We give you ourselves. We give you our hearts. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would teach us. We pray that you would meet us in this text, Lord, that you would give us the words of life. God, we need your wisdom. We need your guidance. We need your promises. We need your hope. Lord, so meet us in this time. We give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the title of my message is The Impact of a Godly Mother, and we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2. Please turn there if you're not already there. Last summer, speaking of some Americana and American history, I was stationed in the Middle East, and I'm surrounded by just brown sand everywhere. And I talked my uh, boss to send me back to the U.S. for a conference so I could go to the conference, but also so I could see my wife again. And uh, we met up in Kentucky, and it was so green. I was like, oh, it's so bright. There's just green forests and trees and bushes everywhere, so much vegetation. And I was driving along the highway in Kentucky, and I saw this sign for a national park, and Abraham Lincoln's birthplace was uh, just off the road. So we pull over, and you can actually see the very log cabin that Abraham Lincoln was born in. And the little museum there, they have a great tribute to his Christian faith, and particularly to his mother, and how great she was raising him in the ways of the Lord. Here's a couple quotes from Abraham Lincoln. He said, uh, God bless my mother. All that I am and all that I ever hope to be, I owe to her. He said, I remember my mother's prayers, and they have always followed me. They have clung to me all my life. Isn't that good? The impact of a godly mother. Godly mothers have enduring impact. We see this in Abraham Lincoln. We've seen this with many of our lives here in this room, I'm sure. And we see this in the pages of the Bible as well. Aren't there some great moms in the Bible? If you stop and think about it, probably the most famous is Mary. She's fantastic. Elizabeth, also a New Testament superstar. If you go to the Old Testament, we can look at Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel. There's lots of good ones we could choose from, but for today I've chosen a woman named 
Hannah. We're going to look at her story. She's the mother of Samuel, and her story is found in 1 Samuel. Her son Samuel would grow up to be a great prophet and priest and judge and kingmaker for Israel. He would anoint Saul to be Israel's first king and David to be Israel's second king. King. As I was studying the life of Hannah this week, one Bible scholar said this, Hannah is portrayed as the most devout woman in the Old Testament. Woo! That's quite the phrase, right? We're going to see why he said that as we follow her story. Hannah's name, by the way, it means grace. Isn't that nice? Beautiful. A beautiful name and a beautiful life of faith that she had. <clears throat> Before we get going too much, let me pause and uh, make a few clarifications. We're going to apply the text today to mothers and to women, but don't worry, guys. I haven't forgot about you. We can broaden the application uh, for you as well. So each point that I'll make, I'll make at both levels, uh, the motherhood application and the broader application for all of us. Guys, you're not off the hook. We're all along for the ride uh, today. Do you want your life to make an impact? Then listen carefully to the story of Hannah. Second clarification. If you're a woman who's never had children or who can't have children, I speak to you today as a 43-year-old man who's been married for over 20 years and still doesn't have children. Life doesn't always go as we thought it would, but that doesn't mean it isn't good or that God hasn't blessed us, right? I love the passage in John 21. At the very end of the Gospel of John, Peter's having a discussion with Jesus, and he points to the Apostle John and says, well, what about him? And Jesus says, if I will this for John, what is that to you, Peter? You follow me. Isn't that good? You know, God has a unique path for each of us. What matters is that we walk with him each step of the way. So with that said, let's look at the path that God had for Hannah. We begin in verse 1. It says, now there was a certain man of Ramathiam Zophim. That's where he's from. And now we're going to get his lineage. He's in the mountains of Ephraim, beautiful little village up there. His name was Elkanah, the son of Joram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. Why do we get all that details about him? Well, his son's going to be a very important spiritual leader for the nation. So they want to travel or uh, uh, trace that lineage. He's a Levite, and he's living up in the mountains of Ephraim. Um, and he's a pretty godly man. He's not perfect, we'll see, but he's definitely devoted to to the Lord, and these are dark days for Israel. Do you remember the book of Judges? Whew, it ends, and it's pretty bleak, right? The nation falls away from the Lord into idolatry, into anarchy. Uh, the key phrase is everybody did what was right in their own eyes, and uh, they've fallen far away from the Lord. And in those days, up is going to rise the prophet Samuel to lead the people back to God and to help uh, transition them. So his father, Elkanah, is a, a pretty godly guy overall, but let's read the very next verse. You see why I'm uh, couching that just a little bit. It said, he had, how many wives? Uh-oh. Ah, what's he doing? How many are you supposed to have? One, right? Go back to Genesis. One man, one woman, the two shall become one. That's God's model for marriage. Jesus reaffirms that in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, they got a little uh, off track, right? They drifted away from God's ideal, and every time you see that, it caused lots of problems. We're going to see the problems uh, with that here again. So verse 2, it says he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, dun, da, 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 and the other was Penina, and uh, she is a pretty mean lady. Boo. Uh, Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. See where this is going? This man went up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. So, uh, Hannah and her husband lived in the biblical village of Ramah. If you're in Israel in modern times, it's the city of Ramallah. It's about 15 miles north of Jerusalem, up in the mountains, halfway between the Jordan River and over to the Mediterranean See, this is where Samuel would be born and where Samuel would reside as an adult and where he would eventually be buried after his death. And every year they would make the journey even further north to the village of Shiloh, a beautiful place, an ideal place for the worship life of the nation. Lush, quiet, peaceful hills, and the tabernacle was there. Inside the tabernacle, the ark 
of the covenant. That's where Joshua established the worship life for the nation after they settled in the promised land. So every year they would go as a family to worship the Lord. So we'll continue reading. Verse 4, it says, Whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give oh, a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival, Peninnah is not nice. Her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. So she wept and did not eat. She's so miserable. She's lost her appetite. She can't even eat. Uh, this is, can you feel the emotion you know, that is here in this rivalry and this mistreatment that Hannah is facing? So verse 8 says, Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Is he the most sensitive husband of all time? <laughs> no, no. He's not meeting her in her pain. Her be yeah, he, he, he's trying to cheer her up, and he kind of swings and misses. Uh, he does not help uh, the situation at all. Ladies, be patient with us, guys. We're a little slow sometimes. You know, Just pray for us, and hopefully we'll come around. So you read verse 8. He tries. It makes no difference. It does not help improve things at all. Verse 9 says, so Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting uh, by the seat of the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. He's doing his job, keeping an eye on things. And it says, she was in bitterness of soul. And she prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. She's crying out to God, right? Lord, please give me a child, give me a son, and I'll give him back to you. And she makes the vow of a Nazarite, which is uh, back to number six. You can trace it. There's some great Nazarite vow figures through the Bible. That's a fascinating study. She says, Lord, if you give me a son, I will give him back to you. Verse 12, it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now, what's Eli's job? He's the priest, right? He's the guy in charge, the spiritual leader for the nation at this time. And he's not the most spiritually sensitive guy either. Uh, eventually, he's going to get in trouble with the Lord. But here we just see him miss uh, the mark. He's watching.